Hey guys, welcome back to the Ryan Knight Show. I've been playing Ayudin Chronicle. Uh, I'm a big fan of Suikoden 2. I loved Suikoden 1 and 2, and I played the whole series. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Was there a 6? I don't think there was a 6. Maybe there was a 6, and I just didn't pay attention. Uh, Suikoden 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. I've done these JRPG tier lists on my channel. Uh, and typically, I usually rank Suikoden 2... Among the top, it's usually among Xeno Gears and Suikoden 2 when it comes to greatest JRPGs of all time. It's like Final Fantasy 7, Suikoden 2, Final Fantasy Tactics, Xeno Gears, and Persona 5 Royal, probably a couple other things. Um, I've been playing Ayudin Chronicle. Uh, I've been doing kind of this podcast thing on this channel, um, but I'm going to do a standalone video to do a full review of this game. Because uh, it's what I've been doing for the last few days, and I'm kind of starting to transition back into games a little bit. I'm going to, almost immediately after this, probably record another podcast episode that no one's going to watch. But, nevertheless, I think is interesting. The first thing I want to talk about with regard to Ayudin Chronicle is the phenomenal art direction. I think that these 2.5D aesthetic graphics uh, really treat the JRPG tradition, formula, recipe, uh, very nicely. Uh, you see it not only in this game, but also with regard to Octopath Traveler 2 and things along that nature, Live a Live and some other things. I think that Ayudin Chronicle does something good because it goes back to that 2.5D style that works so well for JRPG and allows them to be the this massive scope, this worldwide scope with wide-ranging stories, epic stories, about geopolitics and personal sacrifice and all this stuff uh, without getting bogged down and having to narrow the scope too much for graphical concerns or budget concerns. So I think the 2.5D opens up a lot of scope for this type of game. Um, and I also think that it looks really good. I think that Ayudin Chronicle does goes above and beyond uh, what Octopath Traveler 2 and some other games were capable of doing. Uh, Octopath Traveler 2 returned to kind of the SNES PS1 era and delivered to us something that would be from that time. Um, and it still feels a little bit like that with Ayudin Chronicle, but it feels a little bit more like Vanillaware where they're giving us much higher quality sprites. Uh, so it feels like they took that 2.5 art, 2.5D art style, uh, but have a applied uh, modern technology and artistic methods to it, to something that, to create something that still feels quite modern. Um, one thing I both liked and didn't like about the game is that it has tons of Suikoden throwbacks to the point where it's almost relying on them. And I'll tell you the way, the reason I like that uh, for the first thing is because I think this new generation is not familiar with Suikoden 2. It was kind of a niche game. Uh, it does not have this widespread awareness. So I think not I don't know. I just I don't feel like a lot of people are like picking up on this too much. The way it cribs itself, like uh, it almost feels like a knockoff of so we get into. But it's the same people, and it also feels a little bit like a return to form. So if you're a huge fan of Suikoden into, you'll notice that uh, I don't remember her name right now, but your sidekick slash sister slash surrogate sister, whoever she is, uh, is basically Nanami from Suikoden into. Uh, there is a character in this game and a story arc that is basically Necklord from Suikoden 2. Uh, there is a geostrategic moment in this game that is something that exactly, almost exactly, same event structure happens in Suikoden 2. Um, and it feels a little bit narratively weaker than Suikoden 2. So if you're coming at this from as a Suikoden fan you'll feel like a lot of the story is uh, formulaic retreading of stuff Suikoden 2 did better, but in higher graphical, in a better graphical fidelity. The story is slightly worse. The graphics are slightly better. Story one tier worse than Suikoden 2. Maybe two tiers worse than Suikoden 2. Graphics one to two tiers better than Suikoden 2. Um, I feel like this game wants for modernization. I feel like it's such a throwback to Suikoden 2 
that it harkens back so much to this PS1 golden era of RPGs that you're missing out on some of the better ideas that happen, not only for RPGs in general, but also for the Suikoden series specifically over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, for example, um, in Suikoden 3 and 4 and beyond, they had a skill system uh, which gave characters skills such as elemental proficiencies and, um, for example, if you had like critical strike or uh, if you had a character, they had a swing skill, and if you had a character who was very fast, it would let them attack multiple times per round. Um, that actually was a welcome systems evolution to the Suikoden series. So to see some of that stuff missing when it could have been uh, satisfyingly demade, as they say, like uh, as opposed to a remake, a demake, going back from you know uh, the 3D era of Suikoden, demaking it a little bit, going back to an earlier graphical style, but still including those game design updates and ideas. I think I was missing a little bit of that um, with regard to playing this game. A lot of the battles feel like. You just do auto, and the difference between characters amounts to really uh, just their raw statistics, who has the best raw stats, and then the one or potentially two special skills uh, that each character individually has. Um, I think that while you have, obviously, this is the main thrust of the game, to recruit a number of different characters... Uh, the later Suikoden games included some systems that allowed for more individuality between characters, and I'm missing that a little bit. Um, comparing this game to Octopath Traveler 2, Sea of Stars, Chained Echoes, other indie RPGs, Triple I, as they say, RPGs that I would fit into the same category. Um, I think this is my least favorite of those four, but I don't think it's bad. I just simply think Octopath Traveler 2, Sea, sea of Stars, and Chained Echoes are all better than this game, but marginally. It's, it's not a distant fourth. It is in the same ballpark as the other games. Um, I think potentially it's better than Sea of Stars. I think Octopath Traveler 2, Chained Echoes, for my taste, are far and away the, the better of those two. Um, and then Sea of Stars is kind of the bronze medal, and Ayudin Chronicle is maybe in competition for the bronze medal. Uh, comparing this to other Suikoden games, I think, in a nutshell, uh, it's vastly weaker than Suikoden 2, which I think had a phenomenally better plot. Um, I think this game's plot was oddly derivative of Suikoden 2, and executed not as well, uh, for a variety of reasons, both from a writing standpoint and from a uh suikin and two did a really good job with the music uh composing music that felt really attuned to what the scenes were trying to accomplish emotionally and this has pretty good music but it's not as excellent as suikin and two was uh what i will say is that this does have what suikin and two had uh where the sprites are so well done and there are so many story-based animations for every character sprite uh, that the art style, there's nothing lacking there in terms of sprites or any of this stuff. Um, now, comparing this to modern RPGs in general, by which I'm kind of talking about just opening it up to the greater, you know, this 2.5D throwback, golden age, nostalgia kind of RPG where you can have a much bigger scope, uh, but the graphics are more limited and this kind of thing. How does that compare to, say, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth, and some of these other things? Uh, well, I think compared to those other things, I think if I'm being really honest, and I say this as someone who is a lifelong JRPG fan, I want nothing but for this scene to continue to gain relevance and for all of the projects within this scene uh, to succeed within the greater context of the gaming landscape. Uh, I think, if I'm being really honest, I think that uh, Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth was the best game I played this year. Um, I don't think it was quite as good as the original uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon. 
Um, I think Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was the second best game I played this year. I think Square Enix fans, such as myself, want to give it a higher score um, than it really deserves. I think it's about an 8 out of 10 if you look at it through the broader gaming landscape. And I think Ayuden Chronicle is about a 7 out of 10. Um, I think it comes in third place with regard to those. But I do think that this triple I scene for JRPGs, especially turn-based JRPGs, um, is valuable, is very valuable, and is conferring this passion and love for turn-based JRPGs that I grew up with to a new generation of gamers. I think that's uh, incredibly admirable. I think in my generation of gamers, the JRPG squad, the RPG squad, we did not firmly grab a seat at the table and assert our uh, relevance as a genre to the modern gaming landscape in America. I feel like we had like a 10 year period where it was just kind of like, even inside the nerdy fiefdom of modern gaming, it's gaming itself, RPGs were considered even within that niche to be niche, uh, which I don't think is fair. I think they deserve a fair seat at the council among this, all these different genres, uh, you know, especially in the American gaming scene, which is often so far skewed toward FPS and action games. Um, I think that this game spent a great deal of its resources on fully voicing every different character with unique voice actors who are all professional voice actors um, who all bring a different flavor to each and every character. And I think that's a strength of this game. Uh, I think it's a weakness, too. I think it's more of a strength than it is a weakness. Uh, but in terms of being a strength, I think it adds a ton of production quality. And it also doubles down on what is the main draw of this game, which is the collection aspect, the ability to recruit 120 different characters. Uh, where I think it's a weakness is, I think as compared to a lot of modern games, which are more cinematic in nature and the voicing in those games flows like a film or a movie flows in terms of the actors acting off of each other and the scenes and dialogue feeling organic and so on and so forth um i think in this game the dialogue feels recorded within a vacuum it doesn't quite feel like that the voice actors are acting off of each other so much as they are all recording dialogue lines in isolation that play sequentially with regard to the dialogue that's being uh, shown to the player in each scene. It just it feels a little stilted, um, and it feels like things were a little bit recorded inside of a vacuum. I think we need to talk about the mini games as well. I think this is also good and bad. I think that the JRPG development scene, as I've seen from Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth and Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and a couple of other games, uh, they are rife with mini games, which I think is good. I think it adds to the overall scope and production quality of the game. It adds to the variety of the recipe. If we're talking about JRPGs, like a, the main entree, it's like a steak or a hamburger or whatever. You get these mini games. It's nice. It's a bunch of different side dishes. It's your mashed potatoes. It's your kimchi salad. It's your this, that, and the other thing. You're getting all these different things. Uh, in this game, so I'm all for that model. I'm also all for that model in the sense that it seems to me that the primary purpose of, of a lot of these mini games is to uh, give junior developers something to contribute to the product that makes it a more holistic a more enjoyable holistic experience as a whole. A lot of these mini games, not only in this game, but also in Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, feels like something where it was like, okay, we've got these junior developers, we've got six teams of junior developers, each one we're gonna give them a mini game and we're gonna tie that back into the main game. I think that's fantastic. I think that gives a ladder to the junior people in the company to prove their stuff and, and ascend. Um, in this game, I feel like a, several of the mini games needed a little bit more work to be ready for 
prime time in terms of asking customers or fans or players uh, to go through these things. Um, so, for example, you have the cooking, the Iron Chef mini game, um, which is a little underwhelming. Most of the mini games in this game amount to you mash the X button inside the mini game. There's a Beyblade mini game, and it's nothing matters in terms of your strategy or ideas or performance. Uh, you just mash the X button, and you just have to have collected good Beyblades. There's no skill involved in this. Um, and then there's the cooking mini game. You just simply mash the X button uh, while you play this mini game. Uh, there's the fishing mini game. As you, you tap the X button when the fish bites. So all of these mini games, and there's a good variety of them, uh, exist, and they do add the variety and the scope. But they're all underwhelming. They all feel one tier below ready for prime time. They all feel a little bit prototypish prototypal they feel like prototypes a little bit and i think most of them could have stood to uh, be enhanced a little bit um i want to add to and i'm going to try and say this without spoiling anything uh there are three missable characters in this game and i'm gonna i'm if you don't want minor spoilers i'm gonna try not to spoil this at all um there is a character you get if you recruit every other character. There's a character who is only available for a limited window of time. And there is a character who is only available up until a certain cutoff at the end of the game that is before the cutoff for every other character. It's like one dungeon before. It's like you can recruit other characters up to the final dungeon. This character you only have up until one dungeon before. And I'll say this, that third character, I did not know that it had a different cutoff point. And so I locked myself out of, I have 119 characters, or 118 characters outside of that one, and the one you get for recruiting all the characters. I'm not going to go back and play New Game Plus. I'm not going to do a 40-hour game a second time to recruit a missable. And it feels very bad, emotionally, to play a game whose premise is to recruit 120 characters and it's kind of a col the whole thing is a collection inspired project and then find out 40 hours into this 50 hour game that you have missed the opportunity to fully complete the collection of each character it feels really bad and i've seen on reddit like oh you, they should have missables well like maybe maybe i don't know how i feel about that Maybe if I was 14 again and I had nothing but time and no built up regrets about my life and no professional ambition and no real world responsibilities, I would think, yeah, it's okay for a game that's 50 hours long, 40, 50 hours long to have a missable character and then you go back and play the game again and you get the character you miss. But as an adult with responsibilities, I'm kind of like, bro. I'm not going to play this game again. So, like, now I'm just left with kind of a bad feeling in my mouth. Um, and I think the final thing is just the tradition of JRPGs. A long time ago, this is nothing to do with anything, but a long time ago, there was this dude, uh, he was, used to be the CEO of Square Enix, maybe he still is, I don't remember. His name was Phil Rogers, I think. And maybe seven, eight years ago, that dude requested for Square Enix fans to email him and write him an open letter about the direction of the company and what he thinks everyone's doing wrong. And I remember at that time sending this dude a long, maybe two pages long, maybe a page long email uh, explaining that I think that the main problem with Square Enix is that they were the de facto unrivaled king of a particular genre. JRPGs and potentially RPGs as well sort of like Bioware or something like that um, and that they've lost their way they've tried too hard to appeal to the general public they've had all these bizarre misadventures in trying to follow trends and whatever and if they had just stuck to their core competence and their guns they would currently be in a much better position than they are and you can kind of see Atlas catching up on their 
uh, their tail as Atlas has followed um, the strategy of staying in their lane, staying in their core competency, this kind of thing. Um, but I do think in games, there is this tradition of JRPGs. And I think that maybe the discourse around games isn't quite like this anymore. Uh, but there used to be such a diversity of genres. And I think that in modern gaming, you don't see a lot... Of, I mean, JRPGs are certainly having sort of like a resurgence. They're kind of hanging on. But you don't see a lot of like RTS games anymore. You don't see a lot of adventure games. You don't see a lot of, I don't know, you call it like like racing kind of kind of games. It, everything feels a lot more homogenized. Um, and so I really like to see this. tradition of RPGs and JRPGs continue forward because I don't I, I don't think it's as simple as there are video games and it's one big thing and that's that. I think there are traditions of human civilization like storytelling and I don't know Dungeons and Dragons, chess I, I like a lot of different games, but these are fundamentally different things than tennis or poker or basketball or whatever. And uh, I think there's a place for all those things, uh, but I don't like to see the homogeneity. So I'd like to see this robust field of RPGs. Um, I think one other thing that I would touch on... Is that I've had like a I've played a bunch of these mobile phone RPGs and uh, a lot of as far as turn-based battle systems go, a lot of the innovation for turn-based battle systems is going on in this scene uh, in terms of mobile phone RPGs. That's where all like the Chinese RPGs are. That's where all the a lot of the Japanese RPGs are. And uh, one of the things you see in this world that I think would have helped this game out, in addition to, like, the skills system that they had in Suikoden in 3, 4, and 5. Actually, I don't know if they had in 4. I don't really remember. But they, they certainly had in 3 and 5. Um, is in these mobile phone RPGs, which are also turn-based RPGs where you recruit a lot of different characters. They have these things um, that are sort of like the hero skills, abilities that you unlock if you partner certain team members in this game or the Suikoden series um, but in the mobile phone RPGs they have these like faction bonuses so for example if you play Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes and you use all of the Star Wars Rebels characters on the same team you get a faction bonus or if you use all the Star Wars The Old Republic characters on the same team you get a faction bonus or if you use all the light Jedis from the I don't remember the prequel series or whatever you get like a faction bonus um, so that's one of the elements from this RPG that I think they could have uh, stood to adopt from modern RPGs. So I think uh, in terms of what is happening in the RPG scene these days, I think going back to what worked in the golden age of RPGs in the 90s and the early 2000s and PS1 and PS2 uh, is a good idea. But I think you also have to evolve beyond that. I think it is not just going back to what worked but it's going back to what worked and then evolving, you know, recognizing that following trends for the last 10 to 15 years uh, only sort of diluted what made RPGs special, but also acknowledging that it's not actually 1999 anymore. And you can't just make something that would be popular in 1999 in 2024 and think that you have, you know, accomplished it really penetrating into the uh, I don't know the mainstream ecosystem of modern gaming um, alright those are my thoughts on Ayudin Chronicle I guess it's not Ayudin Chronicles it's Ayudin Chronicle alright uh, like and subscribe for this channel um, I think I'm gonna do more of these podcast episodes which is not what this episode is and no one watches these podcast episodes but if I'm gonna do something I enjoy on YouTube 
Uh, it's going to be talking about probably a variety of different subjects and maybe something a little artistic. I don't know. And I always like RPGs, so you'll see these reviews every once in a while. Cheers.